So I think I'll start the introductions and people can still walk in as I speak. So um, we have a mixed crowd here. Uh, this is the pre-conference lectures uh, for the 15th International Conference on Quasicrystals that uh, officially begins tomorrow morning, um, together with the uh, uh, colloquium of the School of Physics and Astronomy at Tel Aviv University. So we have a few uh, local people in the crowd and a few uh, people who just arrived from the airport, I guess, uh, coming in here, and a few people who uh, traveled a bit in Israel in the last few days. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you're here. Um, we've been working and planning this uh, conference for a long time. It's, for me, finally uh, the ability to realize that it's actually happening, that it's actually real and not something I've been working on in my office. Um, so um, I will start uh, by uh, introducing the colloquium speaker, um, but I just want to emphasize that we do have two uh, more lectures, uh, two additional lectures today. Uh, these are both tutorials on uh, different mathematical aspects of uh, quasicrystals, uh, long range, aperiodic long range order, um, um, and uh, everyone here is invited to these uh, tutorials. If you want uh, uh, to come, please do. Um, we have a ceremony in physics today, unfortunately, at the same time, so uh, go get your uh, um, um, nice certificate and run back here uh, to the lectures. Um, if you need to leave in the middle of a lecture or enter in the middle of a lecture, there are doors in the back here. Uh, no one will notice that, you, uh, that you're doing that. So please do come back after the ceremony. Um, so um, I would like to introduce uh, the colloquium speaker. Uh, Marc de Boissier. Um, Marc de Boissier is uh, from uh, CNRS uh, at the University uh, of Grenoble. Um, Marc started his studies in physics and chemistry some years ago, um, finishing his bachelor's degree in 1980, and then he spent um, some seven years as a physics and chemistry teacher in high school and junior high school which is something that uh, we should do more, I think. Um, he then um, did his PhD uh, basically in the first early days of quasicrystals. So he's been there uh, from the start, uh, graduated in 1989, working on um, the initial studies of the structure uh, of quasicrystals, which was a big, big mystery uh, in the late 80s. Um, and since 1989, he's been at uh, CNRS, um, now, uh, French people, they really like acronyms, so um, he is now a senior scientist at CNRS in the LTPCM and uh, also in the SIMAP lab. So now let's see if I can uh, uh, decipher that. So CNRS is the National Center for Scientific Research. Uh, LTPCM is the lab of thermodynamics. Uh, physics, chemistry of materials, is that right? And CMAP is uh, uh, science and engineering of materials and processes. Okay, I got it. It's not written here, I, I memorized it. Um, he's uh, really done some of the most important work in quasicrystals over uh, these last um, three or four decades. Uh, he really is one of the uh, pillars of our community and one of the leaders of uh, research, uh, inspiring a lot of younger people to do research in the field. Um, so it's really, really a great uh, uh, honor for me that is here at the meeting, and I think um, the perfect person to give uh, this kind of an introductory lecture on quasicrystals. So please, uh, we shall begin. Okay. <laughs> Too much light? Yes, 
better? Okay. Hi. You're going to sleep. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe like this would be better. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, Ron, thanks for the nice introduction. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, very nice city in the presence of uh, uh, Dan, who discovered the quasar crystal and makes all my studies real <laughs> because of his discovery. Uh, as uh, Ron said, we, we like acronym in France, so I'm belonging also to the university. But for short, yes, I'm working in Grenoble, University Grenoble Alps, and I'm affiliated to other uh, 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 parts, uh, CNRS and uh, uh, European CIMETAC. Um, before starting, maybe I'll just, uh, at least for the young one, explain where I'm coming from, Grenoble, uh, southeast part of the France. Uh, near Lyon and Geneva in Switzerland. It's a nice, medium-sized town, half a million people. A lot of students, 60,000 students there, a lot of researchers. It's really the second large city in terms of research in France after Paris. Uh, we have nice mountain surrounding. We don't have the seaside, but we have nice mountains. And we can enjoy skiing when the winter season is uh, good enough. This is a view of the uh, downtown area in Grenoble. We have a nice uh, campus where all the students are gathered. And most important, we have uh, two large-scale facilities, the ILL, which is providing neutron for uh, material science studies and biology. And on one hand, this is this uh, reactor here. And we have this large ring, which is the uh, storage ring of the Secretron ESRF, which is also an European uh, facility. So we have two European facilities, and it's a uh, really a, a big uh, advantage being in Grenoble to uh, have access to those uh, two uh, main instruments. Uh, this is an or, another nice view during the night. Okay, so first I'd like to start with the acknowledgement because afterwards I will forget. Uh, first, the people with whom I've been working for many years who unfortunately passed away, uh, Christian Janot, uh, with whom I did my PhD, Ampang Sai, with whom I collaborated for more than 30 years, and Ted Janssen, with whom also I collaborated for a very long time uh, and who passed away a few years ago. I, have, I will be presenting some results obtained in collaboration with many people. I've quoted them some, some of them here. Marek Mihalkovic, Holger Hushner, now in Hulm University, Sonia Frankral, now working in Petra 3, Hiroyuki Takakura and uh, Tsunetomo Yamada in Japan, and many people at large-scale facilities uh, in Japan. Uh, Peter Giller, who furnished many samples, Bernard Aignan at uh, Neutron Facility, which is now closed in, in France, and uh, Bordaro and Baron at other facilities. So <coughs> this talk is being uh, uh, introductive, so for those specialists, I, I apologize. This first slide is just to say, to say that when we want to understand the relationship between a material, a structure, and its property uh, being a uh, a material for energy conversion, photovoltaic, uh, catalysis, ITC superconductor, we always are relying on the structure, and the structure is based on the periodic arrangement of the atom. So uh, periodicity is a key in understanding uh, material science and, and condensed matter in general. These are a few examples. This is biology example. This is a, a thermoelectric example. This is a metallurgy example. This is for catalysis. In all those cases, you need periodicity. And of course, uh, this has been developed for many years. On one hand, we have uh, high tools to uh, determine the structure. This is X-ray, neutron, or electron diffractions, which is shown here. I will come back later on that. So for the structure, we have the tools using the periodicity. And for the physical properties, we also have the tools using periodicity, uh, the uh, Brian zone, uh, the block waves, uh, and all those uh, properties which are derived make use of the uh, fundamental periodicity. Of course, aperiodic crystals are a kind of breakthrough in this field, in this uh, scenario, because we have long range order, but no periodicity. And that will be the aim of my talk, to introduce you a little bit to the beauty on these uh, 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 aperiodic crystals, which are ranked, uh, classified in three categories, in commensurately modulated phases, in commensurate composites, and quasi-crystals that were discovered by uh, Dan Sheshman uh, more than 40 years ago. 
so this is the outlook. I will just make a brief uh, reminder of what we know about periodicity. Sorry for those specialists. Uh, it's very simple. Every uh, material can be described as a unit cell, which is a repeating unit, which is decorated by some atoms. Here I've schematically shown a, a benzene molecule, for instance. And because we have periodicity, only uh, certain symmetry are, are allowed, and for rotational symmetry, only two, three, four, and six, four rotation symmetry are allowed, which leads uh, to the 232 space group. And if we want to uh, solve a structure using this periodic arrangement of atom, that was uh, a method that was discovered more than 100 years ago. You can use X-rays or neutron with a wavelength or electron with a wavelength which is of the order of the interatomic spacing. And because we have periodicity, we have uh, constructive and destructive interferences, and we have what we call Bragg uh, peaks, which are this uh, sharp spot that you are seeing here. Uh, which are exactly the same as uh, what you would observe with uh, uh, optical young fringes. And solving the structure is in fact uh, pretty simple because uh, Fourier, I, had, I need to put the figure of Fourier because Fourier spent a lot of time in Grenoble, so and this is where he derived his uh, famous Fourier series. Uh, so Fourier, uh, the, 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 the spectrum that you see on your detector, so you have here uh, some uh, X-ray coming in, your uh, sample, and then you have diffraction, and the uh, spectrum you see on your spectrum is just the Fourier transform of the real space image. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence, and doing an experiment is pretty simple. You have your crystal here, you rotate it, and what you see, this is what you see exactly on your detector, taking on the zinc scandium uh, system. Uh, you see that you have a strong black peak, weaker ones, uh, but they can all be indexed with three integer because this is a periodic structure. And the intensity of, of the bright peaks that you're seeing here is related to the decoration. So the encoding of the decoration is within the intensity. And a lot of tools have been developed and now it's a mature uh, uh, <coughs> science uh, in crystallography. You can derive from the intensity uh, uh, where the atoms are. And this is the example here for this uh, uh, zinc scandium structure where you have a BCC stacking of this large cluster which is this developed here uh, which I will come back later on. But in real life re perfect crystals do not exist or very rarely. Maybe silicon or germanium that's the only one. All other materials we are using they have defect inside and this is very important because actually Tailoring the defect is a major tool in material science to tailor the properties. Uh, what you see with crystallography is just the time and space average of your average structure, uh, which uh, assume that you have the same unit repeating at infinity, but we know that in reality it's not the case. I'm just showing here an example taken from metallurgy. Uh, this is a uh, light uh, aluminum lithium uh, copper alloy used in uh, aer aeronautics for Airbus and you have these precipitates, which are defects, nice arrangement be in between, but these precipitates are key in uh, uh, having the properties of your material. And this disorder, or defects, they create what we call diffuse scattering in the diffraction pattern. So besides the uh, bright peaks, we also have a signature of the disorder, and it's illustrated here in this barium lantern and fluoride. It's a barium two uh, fluoride where we have substituted uh, uh, barium by lanthanum. So we have black peaks. The black peaks in this figure is just these tiny dots. You don't see them because they are very sharp. And all the rest is what we call diffuse scattering and is related to the disorder which is inside the structure. And the disorder is shown in the next two slides. So we substitute barium 2 plus by lanthanum 3 plus. There is a uh, electronic balance. We have two fluorine for one barium. If we put uh, lanthanum 3 plus, we need to both put one more fluorine. And what's going on is this here. And you see that you have substitution of lanthanum here, a strong new uh, fluorine site occurring, and a strong distortion around your lanthanum. And because of this distortion, we have the signature here, uh, which is uh, the diffuse scattering. So in short, we have periodic order, bright peaks, 
periodic order and disorder, that's most of the case. You have brack peak and some diffuse gathering. And if you don't have any order, then you have a, <coughs> a complete a single ring, no brack peaks. Uh, this is the case, for instance, for uh, metallic alloys or uh, liquid. Physical properties, I said I will not go and make a lecture on condensed matter physics, but this is again based on periodicity, and periodicity is a key ingredient. Uh, it's uh, the way you derive the block theorem and gives you the uh, <coughs> Schrodinger uh, solution, the solution to the Schrodinger equation with a Fourier expansion over the periodic potential. Uh, and all the information is contained in what we call the first Brian zone, which is just the uh, uh, counterpart of the unit cell in real, in real space, and that's the case for silicon, uh, silicon uh, uh, electronic uh, stru band structure, for instance, here, shown here. Uh, <coughs> but if we have this order, so just to make uh, uh, things clear, so again, periodicity is a key ingredient here. Uh, if we have this order, most of the time this order is uh, taken as a, a perturbation on this uh, periodic potential. Uh, that's the case, for instance, in the thermal conductivity. If you introduce disorder, this is pure germanium. If you uh, have a complex structure with disorder, then the uh, thermal conductivity is dropped down, and this is due to the disorder. Uh, that's just a nice uh, drawing done by a, a, older, a PhD student in our lab some years ago, just explaining that if your plane is safe, it's, because, it's not because your crystal is perfect, it's because there's full of defects. And the defects are key in uh, ensuring that your uh, air wings, the, your airplane wings uh, made of aluminum based alloy, uh, are uh, strong enough. Okay? And at the extreme uh, opposite, if you have a completely disordered system, uh, whole physics has been also developed. Uh, and this is, uh, in, in that case, the concept of frustration. Uh, if you put a spins on a triangle, is very important. And we have so-called Anderson localization or spin fluctuation, which are shown here in this uh, particular example. But there are no black peaks, only short range order. And in that case, the physics which is developed is completely different to the one we had seen before. So, uh, apparently crystals uh, really ra uh, raised the question, what is long-range order? So for a long time, long-range order, and that's what I've just introduced you, uh, was associated to periodicity. Periodicity was synonym of long-range order. And because we have periodic order, we have bright peaks. That's what the, the way we uh, uh, see it in uh, experiment. And the assumption that was done, which was completely wrong, uh, was that a bright peak is a signature of periodic long-range order. It can, you can have structure which are not periodic, but still will give rise to bright peaks. So the most famous are quasi crystal discovered by uh, Dan Cheshman, but uh, we, I will show you first uh, a, a first example in the periodic crystal where you have uh, a modulation, and the indexing of the diffraction pattern requires more than three integer indices. So again, these the three families, and I will just concentrate briefly on this family here to explain you how we can have long-range order without any periodicity. And this is actually a pretty simple uh, situation. Uh, you start with a periodic one-dimensional system. You apply on it a distortion, which is sinusoidal here, with a wavelength lambda. And if the ratio of lambda over A is irrational, the obtained structure, which is shown by these blue atoms, which are displaced positive, if, if it's positive, negative, if it's negative. The, this blue atom, this blue sequence, will, is no longer periodic and never repeat itself because lambda over A is irrational. So already we have here an example of a non-periodic structure. And if we look at the diffraction pattern of this non-periodic structure, you have bright peaks here. These one are actually a trace of this uh, underlying periodicity, and we have so-called satellites here, here, and here, whose distance from the main bright peak is 1 over lambda, lambda being the wavelength of this modulation. Of course, uh, here is a perturbation, but nevertheless, uh, it was uh, derived in the 80s by uh, Pim de Volt, uh, Alozo Janner, and Ted Janssen, uh, a method 
to analyze the structure of this non-periodic yet ordered uh, structure. And the trick they have been using is to recover the periodicity in a higher dimensional space. So from 1D we go to 2D, for 3D we go to 4D and so on and so forth. So I will not go into the, into the detail, ne neither give a, a lecture on that, but it's just, for those who are not familiar, just a kind of mathematical trick, so to speak. We lift everything in a two-dimensional space and what was non-periodic becomes periodic and per perfectly ordered and that's the uh, picture of the modulation, modulated chain I've shown you before. If we apply that to uh, an example, a uh, real example, this is a case of rubidium zinc chloride. Uh, tools have been developed using this high dimensional crystallography to determine the structure. And the structure is disordered at high temperature. It's uh, modulated in this temperature range, just below room temperature, and then it locks in. And how does it look like? So if you look at the diffraction pattern, that's the high temperature phase. <coughs> Here you have only two bright peaks, and this is only <coughs> sorry, diffuse scattering. And if you go below the uh, phase transition, you have extra peaks showing up, these uh, blue dots, which are shown here and here, which are the satellites. And from that, you can derive the wavelengths of the satellites and index your uh, diffraction pattern, not with three indices, but four indices. <coughs> so this is this one and minus one here. If you cool down, you have even more harmonics, higher orders of the satellites showing up which makes the uh, diffraction pattern even more complicated. And if you go down even further, everything collapses and goes to a rational approximant. So it's a clear indication, uh, the comparison between these two temperatures is a clear indication that before these two third plus delta, delta is really an incommensurate uh, structure. And using this high dimensional uh, approach, one can derive the structure, and I show you here the three uh, different states, high temperature disordered state, low temperature, three time uh, uh, periodicity, and in between we have these uh, incommensurate uh, phases, and what is shown here is just what is going on if you would travel perpendicular to the screen. You see that the uh, atoms are never at the same position, they are jiggle a little bit uh, around uh, two positions, and never repeat themselves along the C-axis, which is uh, perpendicular to the screen. So one has a whole uh, uh, um, tools to derive this uh, structure for incommensurately modulated uh, phases. So I will now uh, turn to a more complicated case, which is quasicrystals uh, that were discovered in uh, 82. Uh, this is maybe not the original electron uh, uh, diffractogram by Dan Cheshman, but it's quite similar. Uh, it was first observed on uh, rapidly quenched uh, material, and what was striking on those uh, systems is that you have here a tenfold symmetry. So if we start from here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And as I said in the introduction, tenfold symmetry is not compatible with periodicity. So that was already a trace that something strange was going on. So this is, we say that it's a symmetry. At that time, it was even said forbidden, not forbidden for periodic crystals. So now I say forbidden for periodic crystals. So it's not compatible with periodicity. <coughs> this is the uh, Nobel Prize uh, and uh, laureate and the uh, famous paper with uh, Danny Gracias, uh, Danny, uh, John Kahn and Jan Blech, uh, who published the paper actually two years after the discovery, and that was really a breakthrough in the community uh, to, uh, w that activated the, the, the whole field. So the first quasicrystal was op were obtained by rapid quench from the melt. Metallurgy, actually, that was metallurgy. Uh, uh, a lot of people were, were working in metallurgy. So that's a nice view from uh, uh, Professor Nissen and uh, oh nice, another one from Ampang Sai where you see the nice uh, uh, aluminum manganese rapidly quenched alloy with the uh, pentagonal flowers. Uh, and those quasicrystals, they have acosahedral symmetry. Uh, acosahedral symmetry is uh, characterized by a five-fold axis here, 
a three-fold axis here and a two-fold axis, and of course you have a relationship between all those angles, and this must be fulfilled if you look at uh, your diffraction pattern, and I'm taking here a nice electron microscopy taken by Marc Audier, where you clearly see the two-fold uh, diffraction pattern here, the three-fold symmetry here, and the five-fold symmetry or ten-fold symmetry because of Friedel law here. So it's really acosahedral uh, symmetry. Uh, that's not the only one that is possible. There are many other uh, uh, possibility. Acosahedral symmetry is the only one which is really a three-dimensional quasicrystal, and we have other quasicrystals where we have periodicity in one direction and quasi-periodicity uh, perpendicular to this uh, uh, direction, octagonal, dodecagonal, uh, and decagonal, I will concentrate in the following on this acosahedral symmetry. But before going to the uh, uh, study of the, of the structure, uh, let's start a little bit of history. So which system formed quasicrystals? And that was a, a lot of debate at the beginning because the first one were only obtained by uh, rapid quenching. So is it really long range order? Uh, the first breakthrough came from uh, uh, Marc Audier. At that time, he was working at Pechinet for aluminum alloy. And uh, during the study, they found this very nice uh, quasicrystal single grain. So that was really a breakthrough in 86 uh, with the nice tricontahedral tri shape, uh, nice also diffraction pattern. And you see here a nice uh, arrangement of several grains, uh, which is drawn here. Uh, and that was the first real single crystal, single quasicrystal. In passing, that was a study done by Pechinet for aluminum lithium alloy to have light uh, wings made of aluminum. So it took 25 years, but now the Airbus A380 and A350, they have wings with aluminum lithium copper alloy in it. So one, one indirect ap application. Uh, but most of the stable quasicrystals, they were discovered by uh, Ampang Tsai, uh, who discovered the first stable aluminum copper iron, and a whole series of uh, intermetallic compounds that can be obtained from the melt, cooling slowly, and exactly in the same way you would obtain periodic crystal. So that was really a breakthrough, because you, we had now single crystals with a large number of reflections and extremely high quality. So that's the case. I should just showing a few, uh, aluminum, lithium, copper, copper, uh, iron, aluminum, palladium, manganese, zinc-based uh, material, cadmium-based, I will come back later. This is an example of aluminum, copper, iron, uh, grown in uh, Ampang Tsai lab, uh, Ems lab in the USA, in Jan Fischer, zinc, magnesium, yttrium, with NAS, the decadral shape. And this is a stroke rescue grain uh, that we grew in our lab. This is a scale in centimeters, so you see you can uh, make it quite large. Of course, it's in France, so I have to say that's why it's a form of a bottle of wine. But uh, <laughs> we can grow, the main message is that we can grow quasi-crystal as we can grow periodic crystal. Not so much difference, actually. Uh, it was also observed in other systems recently in a thin layer of barium titanate oxide, which is a perovskite, uh, which is a quite also important breakthrough and uh, a whole series of quasicrystals have been found in soft condensed matter, and Ron is uh, one of the world specialists in this uh, community uh, studying this soft condensed matter. This is an example of supramolecular dendritic liquid crystals where the length scale now is no, not the interatomic distances, one angstrom, but rather 10 nanometer. Uh, it's another example uh, from the group of uh, doTERRA with a length scale of 50 nanometer in polymers. So we have a lot of quasicrystals showing in many different, uh, different systems. And the question was first, how can we derive uh, the atomic positions? So there are two, two routes. The first one is to use what is called the Penrose tiling. I will not too much elaborate too much on it. And the second one is the high dimensional crystallography that was introduced by the Wolf and Janssen, which is just the continuation of what I've shown previously. Uh, the Penrose siding was also a Nobel rate, Penrose also a Nobel rate for other studies, not the, the, the tiling. This was just a side game for him. Uh, 
discovered this tiling with two tiles, which was shown by uh, Alan McKay to produce a diffraction pattern with a lot of uh, uh, sharp black peak, and what was a clear demonstration that we could have uh, in 82 a long range order without periodicity. And this has been used, for instance, to study those periodic, periodically stacked quasi-crystal, decagonal quasi-crystal. I'm just showing here one example uh, of Paul Stein Steinhardt and EGAB on the aluminum nickel cobalt, where they have decorated the tiles with atoms and superimposite on uh, electron, uh, electron micrography. But the most fruitful uh, uh, approach has been using the superspace crystallography, which in some sense has been rediscovered by quasi-crystal people. I'm just putting some names here, Kalugin, uh, Kitaev Levitov, Elser, Duno and Kass, and Denis Gracias, who was the first one to really use this technique to solve structure. Peter Back also. And again, the trick is that the periodicity is recovered in a, a higher dimensional space. So to illustrate that, I will go rapidly. Uh, I don't want to make too much detail on this. I'm, I will be using this uh, Fibonacci chain, which can be uh, constructed by so-called inflation construction. You have two tiles, long and short. You substitute the short by the long, and the long by the long short, and in the end you have this infinite sequence, which is non-periodic. And if you look at the diffraction pattern of this uh, Fibonacci chain, it's a kind of prototype of quasi-crystals. You have sharp bright peaks that can only be indexed with two indices, and the two length scale here, here, and here, uh, 0, 1, and 1, 0, are related by the golden mean tau. They are irrational, and again, we have these two irrational length scale that uh, makes up the diffraction pattern. Because it's uh, infinite uh, and uh, very well ordered, we have, in theory, an infinite number of black peaks, and that's what's going on. If I change the scale here, I go to 10 to the minus 2, from 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 5, you see that you have more and more black peaks showing up. If you would go further, you would have more and more uh, black peaks. In reality, we'll see that we have some cutoff, and hopefully uh, we have a finite number in between in a finite range of uh, reciprocal space. And the, uh, uh, <coughs> The uh, uh, trick, so to speak, the mathematical trick going on, uh, being uh, going back, going, going to this uh, periodic image is because you have uh, an indexing with two indices, every uh, black position can be indexed with two in integers. You can map this uh, figure into a periodic map, which is shown here. So it's exactly the same. Uh, you, refine the, you find this 1-1, one, one, which is here. The 3-2 is here. The 5, 3 is here. So there is just a one-to-one -one correspondence, and you go from uh, something that does not look all uh, periodic to something which is periodic, but with an extra dimension. And the trick is really to use this periodic description to describe the structure of your quasicrystals. So if we have a one-dimensional quasicrystal, the image, uh, the periodic image, is shown here. And it, these are the small uh, 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 lines, which are called atomic surfaces, that are used to describe the uh, uh, atomic structure. So for those who are not familiar, don't be uh, afraid. It's just to be seen as a kind of mathematical trick. Let's go back to the diffraction pattern of a real quasicrystal now. Uh, this is <coughs> aluminum copper iron uh, provided by uh, Ampang Sai. And if I look. Beside the tenfold symmetry, if I look at the uh, ratio of the length scale, I can see between the uh, strong black peak, I see that if this one is one, then I have tau, where tau is the golden mean, an irrational number, then tau to the square, tau to the power of three, and so on and so forth. So again, we have two length scale and uh, a kind of self-similarity. You can also notice that you have pentagons that are scaling up with the same uh, golden mean, uh, up to uh, this length scale. So these are the two kind of signature. We have the symmetry and these two length scale that are showing up, and moreover, the uh, black peaks, which are very sharp. It's another example, just now using X-ray uh, diffraction. And please notice that the scale here is uh, logarithmic. 
uh, we have again one tau, tau square, tau uh, to the power three, tau to the power four uh, uh, scaling of the diffraction pattern. In principle, because it's acosahedral now, instead of two indices for one to 2D, I have to use six indices and the periodicity is recovered in the six dimensional space. I'm using just a shorthand notation here. And to finish with the diffraction uh, pattern, uh, <clears throat> there was a, a long time question, is it really long range order? Is it really a black peak? And that's a quite nice, I think, uh, answer to this question. What, we are, what you're seeing here is just a single pixel detector uh, black peak taken in an extremely high resolution setup uh, of one of the aluminum palladium manganese one sheet has been annealed. And from this, you can derive that the correlation length that you can derive from the width of this black peak is 10 microns. So it's really, really long range order, as good as for periodic crystals. And finally, uh, we have a periodic uh, approximant, uh, which were predicted by the theory and which occurred also in, in, uh, in practice. And the, the way it can be seen in this high dimensional space is uh, shown here. If instead of this line we take, which is irrational with respect to the uh, underlying uh, square lattice, we take rational approximant 1-1 one, one, or 2-1, we have periodic uh, distribution of the tile. And this is what is observed experimentally uh, in this cadmium ethereum system. So <clears throat> I will now illustrate that on the uh, structure for which we have the most detail, which is the cadmium ethereum uh, uh, case, uh, where we start from cadmium-6 ethereum, it's periodic, 1.5 nanometer, 5.8 cadmium ethereum, it's still periodic, 2.53, and if we change slightly, 5.7, all of a sudden it becomes acosahedral, non-periodic, but yet well-ordered. And this is shown here. So this is a, tr a, a two-dimensional uh, section of the reciprocal space. This is the periodic one. You clearly see the periodicity, one, one approximant. And this is the quasicrystal, no periodicity. But on the other end, what you can immediately see is that the strong black spot, they seems to be located almost at the same position. And that's a signature of the fact that both structures are built up with the same cluster. And that's what has been used to describe uh, this structure. We start with a central uh, tetrahedron, then we have a cadmium, which is in the shape of a dodecahedron, then an acosahedron, and this is only ethereum atom now. <coughs> this is called a nicosidodecahedron, and finally a large shell, which is called a triencontahedron. So it's summarized here. It should not be mixed up with uh, fullerene or things like that. This is really completely different. We are piling up a large and a small atom. So it's a dense spare packing, if you wish. But the main point is that in the 1 1 approximant, we could know how this is connected, what is the structure, and we can use this information to uh, derive. Uh, I'm sorry, the, this, this is not working, uh, to derive the um, uh, uh, connection in, in the quasicrystal. So in the 1-1 one, one approximant, it's a BCC stacking, and there is an overlapping uh, uh, structure shown here. It's connected along twofold, and it's overlapping along threefold. And using these building blocks, and using the knowledge we have from the uh, diffraction pattern, which, is, which I will skip here, we can derive a complicated uh, six-dimensional model. And that's because we had all those tools. We had the synchrotron data. We had the tools developed for uh, deriving the structure uh, developed uh, essentially by uh, Akeji Yamamoto for this uh, specific case. Uh, we had this binary crystal that all the puzzle could be uh, solved. And uh, <coughs> I think it's better to go directly to uh, a real space. So that's the distribution of cluster that you could derive from this uh, high dimensional crystal. Uh, the environment can be deduced from the 6D model. I will show you in uh, more example here. Here what is shown is not the 
atomic distribution, but just the uh, position of the clusters. So each dot is a central part of this big uh, green cluster that are shown here, right? So we see we have a cluster here, we have a cluster of cluster, and then we have a cluster of cluster of cluster, and that goes to infinity. So one has a hierarchical signature of the structure, which is, again, a signature of this quasi-periodic long-range order. Uh, also, if we look at what's going on in projection, uh, this is not completely random because this is older and we can clearly see that this is the projected electron density we have dense plane perpendicular to the twofold uh, direction. And finally, uh, the last point that was really a surprise when we uh, derived the structure of this uh, uh, system, uh, the central tetrahedron is strongly distorting the uh, outer shells. So initially we thought that all the clusters should have a cosedral symmetry. Uh, so actually it's not necessary. And indeed, they don't have a cosedral symmetry. The acosedral symmetry is only recovered beca because we have the all orientation of this cluster with respect to the um, acosedral uh, point group. So the overall acosymmetry is uh, still preserved, but locally we have a strong distortion. And structure determination is now uh, mature for quasicrystals, and this is another example where even the disorder uh, could be uh, derived. <coughs> okay, a few words to finish on physical properties. So fi I've advertis advertised before that periodicity is a key ingredient for understanding physical properties. So how can we do it for aperic crystal? I would say it's still an open question. It has been solved for 1D system, a few of them, a few two-dimensional system, but it's still an ongoing uh, theoretical uh, uh, <coughs> perspective. We can no longer apply the block theorem. Maybe there is uh, an approach that could use the superspace, but right now we don't have any uh, clue for that. Uh, <coughs> and basically, two, two approaches have been uh, 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 used exact calculation, uh, 2D and 3D. This is ma mainly atomic scale simulation on large periodic approximant, and you look at what's going on when you go further and further. Experimentally, uh, it's even more difficult, I would say. Uh, the signature of the quasi-periodic long-range order specificity is mostly done by comparing with the periodic approximant. So if there is something special to quasicrystal, it should be different from the uh, periodic approximant. I will briefly go through a few examples. Uh, electronic properties, I think electronics or phonons, these, these are quite similar. Uh, one very uh, peculiar prediction made by theory is that the electron wave function should be what they call critical. It's neither extended all over the crystal and it, as in a simple crystal. It's neither localized as it is in a, a simple uh, disordered system. It's rather uh, displaying the underlying self-similarity of the structure. And you see here uh, an example taken from Fujiwara where you see the uh, wave function, electronic wave function is uh, strong when it's dark and it's dark where the local environment is the same. It's weak, if you take this weak part, it's the same as this weak part here, or the same as this weak part. So the, the fact that you have this self-similarity uh, underlying is playing a specific role and should give rise to very specific uh, electronic property. Unfortunately, experimentally, this is very difficult to uh, analyze, and there is maybe one uh, recent work where it has been uh, uh, emphasized, although it's still a, a matter of debate. Uh, this is the community working on heavy fermions. So heavy fermions, it's another word to say heavy electrons. Electrons are not heavy, but if they are in some specific systems, there are correlation between electrons which make them as if they had a large mass. And what the people what the group of uh, Deguchi and Sato in, and uh, Ishimaza in Japan have discovered in this gold, aluminum, iterbium uh, quasicrystals is that if they cool down the system for the quasicrystal and they cool down 
and look at the susceptibility, magnetic susceptibility, they have a very different behavior, uh, which could be related to the fact that we have uh, this hierarchical uh, <coughs> electronic wave function on the quasicrystal, although it's not yet proven. Another uh, long time question was, is it possible to have a magnetic long range order? In principle, quasi-periodic order is compatible with magnetic order. There is no reason. And Ron has derived all the space group that are uh, compatible with uh, quasi-periodicity and magnetism. But for many years, uh, only spin, so-called spin glass, which means short range order, has been observed. So it's a nice uh, magnetic scattering uh, taken in, uh, by the work of uh, uh, Taku Sato on uh, zinc magnesium uh, rare systems, uh, and only short range order was observed. And the question was, is it really feasible to have a long range uh, magnetic order? And the answer came only recently, uh, thanks to uh, studies by the group of uh, Ruji Tamura and Halak Goldman. Uh, this is the uh, project in, in Japan. Uh, they first discovered that the 1-1 one -one approximant gold silicon terbium can be ordered magnetically, and that's the magnetic solution. So the spins here are shown by these uh, blue arrows. They did even more. They studied a lot of different samples and could have a good understanding of what is the origin of the magnetism. And the origin of the magnetism is the uh, ratio E over A, where E is the number of electrons uh, and A is the latest parameter. And you see you have a region where it's antiferromagnetic, region where it's ferromagnetic, and region where it's a uh, spin glass. So this is uh, the work, sorry, I forgot to put the uh, reference, but this is a work for Ruji Tamura and co-worker. And again, they have all this understanding. And taking this understanding, they could go a step further and recently show that in the gold gallium terbium acosahedral quasicrystal, there is a long range magnetic order, which is shown by this curve here, which is the magnetic susceptibility, where you have a clear change around 25K, but it's also shown by this nice neutron experiment where uh, you go below the, phase, the magnetic phase transition and you see that some bright peaks are uh, showing up, and these are magnetic black peak, which is a clear cut of the magnetic uh, long range order. <coughs> a few words on phonons and phasons, and then I will uh, come up to the, the conclusion. So, phonons, uh, <coughs> this is a, a, a picture taken from the work of uh, Michael Engel. Sorry, uh, something went wrong here with the <laughs> diffraction pattern, but it's the same as for electrons, because we have a one dimension, this is a one dimensional quasicrystal, because we have long range order, there is, and, and no periodicity, uh, there is a range for which the uh, states are so-called critical. But the main point I want to make here is that although we cannot define a zone boundary because we don't have periodicity, we can define pseudo zone boundary which are related to strong Bragg peak here, strong Bragg component. And what is shown here is the uh, inelastic neutron scattering uh, measurement that you would do on a Fibonacci chain. And you clearly see that you have uh, branches starting from the strong Bragg peak with gap opening. And the gap opening is stronger when the, uh, uh, the, the Bragg peak in between are very strong. So you have a large gap here, a smaller gap here. And of course, you have an infinite number of gaps. But if you take the major zone boundary, you clearly see that you can somehow explain what's going on. Uh, we did compare that to uh, um, in the zinc, magnesium, scandium uh, quasicrystals, where we have both the 1-1 one, one approximant and the quasicrystal, which is shown here. And what is shown here is what is observed in the 1-1 one, one approximant. We have a single zone boundary and a well-defined uh, pseudo-gap opening here. Whereas here, because we have two pseudo-zone boundary, we have a smaller gap opening. First things, if you look from far, it's a bit disappointing. It's almost the same in the 1-1 one -one approximant and in the quasicrystal. The only thing we can say, okay, here 
we have two zone boundary, we can use this scheme of pseudo zone boundary to interpret our data. But I would say it's a bit uh, disappointing. We, we, can, we don't have any clear cut trace of the quasi periodicity. Nevertheless, we, uh, with the uh, help of Marek Mihalkovic, we had a lot of simulations uh, done, uh, which do reproduce pretty well uh, what is observed experimentally, so which just demonstrate that we can, uh, uh, using large <coughs> periodic approximants, reproduce a quasi-crystal. And we also uh, could show that this central tetrahedron, which is playing a quite important role, is actually uh, moving constantly, uh, even at relatively low temperature, it's 170K. Uh, so you see the central tetrahedron is constantly reorienting, and when it's reorienting, is distorting the uh, uh, neighboring shells. So that's what is going on in the 1-1 cubic approximant. And the same is going on in the uh, <coughs> uh, zinc scandium quasicrystal, or zinc magnesium scandium quasicrystal. You have a kind of con continuous rotation, but again, you have this central tetrahedron that plays an important role, uh, and for which maybe we uh, uh, relate that to uh, phason mode. Oh, sorry, I may be a little bit long. I have maybe five minutes and take the, the last five minutes to say a few words about phason. So <coughs> we have seen electron, magnetism, phonons. There is one very peculiar uh, um, property that is specific to quasicrystal and is, which is named phasons. And those phasons, they are just related to symmetry breaking arguments. So they are just general arguments that allows to derive them. And the main argument is that the free energy, if you take this uh, high dimensional uh, picture, the free energy of the system is independent of the way you put the, the cut, this horizontal line. You can put it everywhere. So if you do that, you can derive and describe that there are phason modes in the structure which are uh, diffusive type excitation. And I think the uh, nicest uh, way to uh, illustrate that is taking a, a toy model derived by uh, Professor Trebin who is in, in the room and uh, uh, Michael Engel using a double well potential. And you see that uh, using this double well potential and making some temperature, there are many, many uh, reorientation going on. And these many, many reorientations uh, have some correlation. They are not completely uncorrelated. And that's this correlation between this reorientation that give rise to the uh, phason modes. And the phason modes uh, have a very specific signature. They can be seen as some kind of disorder. We've seen in the introduction that uh, disorder give rise to diffuse scattering. It's exactly the same here. If we have phason disorder, we should have uh, diffuse scattering related by uh, two constants that we call phason elastic constant does not really matter. Uh, and indeed, in most, in all quasicrystal, actually, we could derive that the uh, diffuse scattering which is observed can be described by this uh, phason elastic constant. This is an example here in the aluminum palladium manganese case. Uh, we clearly see the nice uh, experimental one and the nice uh, <coughs> Uh, reproduction using only two parameters. That's for the phasor elastic constant. It's a more recent uh, result on the zinc scandium. This is using now this uh, large two-dimensional detector. You have a whole overview of reciprocal space. You see a lot of diffuse scattering all over here beside the black peaks. And that is what is reproduced, uh, the work done by Tsunetomo Yamada you clearly see that the diffuse scattering is very well reproduced, which is a clear uh, indication that we have these phason modes present in those structures. And again, if we compare with the cubic approximant, there is a clear distinction. The blue line is the 1 1 approximant, the red line is the uh, <coughs> uh, quasi crystals for the same similar black peak. And you clear see, clearly see that there is an excess of diffuse scattering here, telling you that what is observed is due to the long range quasi periodic order. So, just to finish, 
uh, I think there is one fascinating question is, what are the mechanisms that are stabilizing quasicrystals? And why is that that if you go from cadmium 6 terbium to 5.8 and 5%, so you see here it's really a tiny difference in composition. You go from a periodic crystal to a quasi-periodic crystal. Uh, frustration is certainly a key ingredient. Uh, electronic properties is also an ingredient. Uh, I do believe that phason mode is playing a role, but still to be proved in this particular system. Uh, but I think it's still fascinating and still there are a lot of uh, uh, things to uh, be learned uh, about that. So to conclude, uh, I'd just like to point out, I've shown you the tip of the iceberg, quasicrystal, but there is a whole s series of uh, systems where you do have a periodic order. You have it in minerals, oxide, we've seen, ITC superconductors, multiferrics, intermetallic, of course, single element under pressure, organic molecules, protein crystals, charge density wave magnetic structure. So there is a whole range of structure that do present a pretty uh, long range order and for which I think there is a lot of things to learn. And as a last perspective, I would say that the knowledge that has been learned in the community of Aperi crystals can be transferred to now to real systems. And real systems, they are characterized by complexity. Complexity by the number of atoms in the unit cell. Of course, the quasicrystal is the paradigm of uh, extreme complexity, infinite number of atoms in the unit cell. But you have also the disorder. And these are the two parameters that are at play when you do material science. And Learning how to deal with complexity is, I think, uh, something that has been uh, a great uh, <coughs> knowledge that has been gained uh, studying quasicrystals and apparatic crystals. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. <coughs> <coughs> so thank you very much. Um, I couldn't have done this better. It was a very... Um, comprehensive overview of, uh, as you said, the tip of the iceberg. Uh, we have some time for questions, uh, if anyone dares to ask. Yes. Well, this is a bit orthogonal to what you were discussing, but as an outsider, I was wondering whether there are any uh, chemistry or physics Im implications to the recent discovery of the aperiodic monotile. A periodic monotile that was recently discovered. Uh, so, are there any physics or chemistry implications of that discovery? Uh, I don't. Uh, I don't know uh, any applica uh, right application. But this monotile was uh, another version of a monotile. <coughs> was uh, the the one I showed for the uh, decagonal uh, decoration where. Actually, the Penrose tiling can be described by a single tile. Uh, so it's, it's not the same monotile as the one you're referring to, but uh, that, that's something people are trying to actually come through uh, <clears throat> to have uh, a single tile, of course, makes, uh, in principle, the decoration maybe uh, easier. But the, the recently discovered monotile is pretty, uh, pretty large, if I remember correctly. So I don't know of any application right now. So we will have a lecture on the, this newly discovered hat monotile during the week. So if you'd like, you can come and, uh, and ask. There was another question uh, over here, just a second. Uh, I want to go back to uh, the magnetic properties that you were talking about. Uh, so E over A ratio is basically filling, right? Sorry? E over A ratio is basically filling. You are doping the system. Yes. And I don't, don't understand clearly why is it going from antiferromagnet to a ferromagnet to a spin glass. Can you give a physical intuition for that? Uh, so maybe there are, uh, I don't know if I saw Ryuji in the, he, he might answer. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, it's, it's an archaic interaction between local spins. So uh, if we change the electron per atom ratio, we change the Fermi energy. So by shifting Fermi energy, you can, you can change the uh, archaic interaction smoothly. 
everyone is here in the room, so we can just go and ask the people who know the answers. Yeah, so maybe a basic question. You talked about like heavy fermions and the electron mass. If I can't even, def I don't have periodicity, can I even define a band structure to have an effective mass for the electrons? How can I think about an effective mass in these uh, crystals? Yeah, so uh, as I said, this is, uh, there, there is a lot of experiment, and now the theory is trying to derive and understand what, what's going on. Uh, there are cal uh, calculations on large uh, periodic approximants that shows that you could have the same uh, kind of uh, behavior with heavy fermions. I'm not so much a specialist, so I cannot uh, go further, but yes, there is no reason why it should not occur. It's because you have this strong correlation between electrons. This is 4F. Uh, so, so maybe if I can add, yeah. when you saw a lot of the images here, both theory and experiment from uh, both the periodic approximants and the quasi-crystals, um, the brightest, strongest signals look very similar in both of them. So uh, in many cases, you see even in the quasi-crystals something that effectively uh, looks like a continuous band, even though if you zoom in, you'll see a lot of gaps uh, going in there. But in a, in a real life experiment with real temperature and real defects, uh, you often smear uh, these uh, tiny little gaps and, and then you have something that looks like a band and then you can define um, all these properties. Uh, there was one more question here. You, you talked a little about uh, disordered quasi-crystals. I have a more uh, specific question. How different or how similar are the uh, 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 properties caused by disorder in quasi-crystals as compared to periodic crystals? Um, yeah, that's a, a very good question. The, I don't think there is a clear answer uh, yet. Uh, the main point I wanted to make is that the disorder is a kind of different. Uh, in, in a, let's say if you take a simple alloy, then you have vacancies. That's one kind of disorder. You have chemical uh, disorder. You substitute A over B. Uh, in a quasicrystal, you may have, of course, the same kind of disorder, vacancies and uh, chemical substitution. And I would say they would give rise to the same kind of uh, effect. But there is this uh, specific disorder which is related to the very uh, arrangement of atoms which uh, are called phasons and which uh, reorganize themselves. And those uh, phasons there should give rise, uh, to my point of view, to different uh, influence on the physical properties, which one I cannot say. It's only a guess. Okay, so I think we'll, oh, one more last question or comment. Yeah, more like a historical comment. You quite rightly pointed out that the superspace approach had this predecessor in incommensal structures, which in turn, the predecessor in 1890 in the work of Peter Bohl, who showed that quasi-periodic functions are sections of periodic functions, more variables, both of which was known to Peter Kramer and, and primed him to construct his icosahedral models because he knew both the old work and the incommensal structures. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I actually, it was maybe a bit fast, but the, 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 the 3D uh, Kramer and Neri uh, Hammond tiling. Okay, thank you. And, and th this uh, leads me to. Uh, invite you all to these two tutorials that we have this afternoon because one of them is specifically going to discuss um, almost periodic functions, which is what we're talking about. Um, so I really invite you to stay. We're going to have coffee uh, now and right after the coffee break um, we will have the first tutorial. The second tutorial has to do with uh, topology on quasi-crystals, on tilings and topological quantum numbers. Um, so I, I really uh, invite you to come, and I want to thank Mark again for his lecture.
אני חושב שבלמטה שם.